Good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this Q&A session on radiotherapy. So I'm just waiting for Naaman and Joe to join us and then we'll get cracking with all of your questions. Just waiting for Naaman to join us. Hi, Jo. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Happy Monday. <laughs> Happy Monday, yes. I'm just letting Naaman into our chat. How are you, Sarah? All right? Yeah, I'm okay, thank you. All right, very Monday-like today, actually, I must say. <laughs> Hi, Naaman. Hi. Hello. So um, thank you so much both for um, joining us. I thought it'd be a really good opportunity for quite selfishly myself and uh, other people to ask questions about radiotherapy. Um, I've got a lot of clients who are about to go through the treatment, a few that are going through it as we speak, and then obviously recovery. Um, I come into a lot as well. Um, so this is Naaman and Joe. Naaman and Joe are ther therapeutic radiographers, and they started the amazing podcast Rad Chat, where they talk to patients, healthcare professionals, all about radiotherapy and what that brings and what that means, and trying to educate them from all different perspectives. So um, I wondered if you both might be able to start telling us a little bit about you. Joe, do you want to start? Yeah. So hello, everyone. Um, so Joe McNamara. I am one half of Rad Chat. Um, definitely not the better looking. Uh, no one's got, <laughs> no one's got that that medal. Um, but I am a senior lecturer, so I work at Sheffield Hallam University. And yes, therapeutic radiographer through and through. Um, but I was also a national clinical fellow with Macmillan. Um, still keep my hand in clinically um, and hopefully help to educate the future workforce so I do a lot of work with patients but also thinking about the future of, of healthcare and also the future of radiotherapy radiation treatments to ensure that we're essentially um, f foolproofing the future workforce to know what's going on so that's me. Brilliant. Hi, um, not sure I'm the better looking half, but okay, thanks. Even with this <laughs> tash, dance, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is real, I promise. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm the other half of Rad Chat. Um, I'm an advanced practice therapeutic radiographer. So any patients who have any sort of side effects, so physical, psychosocial, anything really, um, I'd be their first port of call to help them out. Uh, I'm also leading a lot of skincare research for the Society of Radiographers. Um, and I've been told I need to say this more often, but I did win Radiographer of the Year this year. Um, partly did. thanks to Joe writing an amazing nomination, but um, a few other people as well. So yeah, that's me. Thank you for having me as well. That's okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I myself had external radiotherapy and internal radiotherapy. And to be honest, I didn't know a huge amount about the treatment before I went into it. Obviously, I was explaining the basics, um, but it was kind of like sign this consent. Here we go. Um, and so I thought it'd be really useful for other people like me who were just about to start treatment just to talk through um, how to prepare if you're going through it, what to do and how to, you know, kind of get through it and then also how to recover from it. Um, so in terms of your roles, um, what's like? What's a typical day like for you? For you both? So I'll, I'll let Numan start because his is much more interesting. <laughs> um, mine's very varied. So I can see any treatment site that will have radiotherapy. So skin, lung, breast, whatever. Um, Patient-wise, um, yeah, just anything at the minute. We're quite short-staffed, so whatever I'm required to do, I'm just doing, which is actually quite exciting. So I get to go into the treatment rooms every now and then which I've missed. Um, yeah. Jo? Yeah, so I um, I still lecture, so I see lots of students and help educate, and I do that across health and social care. Um, some days I go into schools or colleges and help promote the profession. Um, I work, do research and evidence-based practice. Um, and then also sometimes I'm working on projects um, essentially helping again to support the future workforce. Um, I do lots of charity work. So on a Friday, if it was a Friday, this Friday, I spent half the day uh, traipsing around giving out 5k your way uh, brochures to doctors 
surgeries and a dentist and so it's really varied and I think that's maybe why I love being a therapeutic radiographer and doing what I do because it every day is different yeah yeah and um in terms of your career and um how many years it spans how has radiography changed and because I remember you know I was treated four years ago and I already know from that time to now stuff's changed and how precise you can be with the treatment so what can patients expect now and how does it benefit them being you know more precise more exact it's it's such a rapidly uh, progressive area as in lots of healthcare but I think because we rely so much in radiation therapies on technology and software because that's evolving artificial intelligence which I think when you say AI people think of robots and it sounds very scary Terminator. yeah yeah but actually um, artificial intelligence allows us to really progressively plan radiotherapy treatments, you know, rather than having, when I qualified, we were planning radiotherapy by hand. And wow. now you press a button and it does it all for you. Like the, the huge developments that I've seen through my career have been amazing, but you know, that allows us to be more patient focused. So more hands-on making sure that the patient knows what to expect. And I think that's where, at the moment because the workforce is so short and pressurized and the nhs is really struggling that's where sometimes i think things like rad chat or the amazing work you do sarah really helps because it's making sure that patients know what to expect mm. from something that can be very scary because of the yeah. technology you know you see a linear accelerator and i know the first time i saw one i gasped i walked into the room and i was like oh my gosh this is a massive piece of equipment that's that just looks really scary and is that's that the big yeah so it's 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 a large arm that basically comes over a couch and it rotates round and delivers the very high ionizing x-rays um but yeah it can be really scary and that's why we want to promote and talk about radiation treatment so it's not so scary and people kind of know what to anticipate but the you know the huge developments we've seen are just yeah massive and that's not going to stop either um mm. that will continue and hopefully make treatments easier quicker more reliable you know be more efficient um but also thinking from a patient perspective reducing side effects you know the mm. more targeted we can be that's going to have a really positive impact on patients not having unwanted side effects short and long term yeah um, okay, so let's start. I've got lots of questions. Thank you very much for submitting questions. Let's start with preparation or prehab, as uh, some call it. Uh, what should patients do to prepare for radiotherapy? I mean, from an exercise and movement point of view, I know that there are certain positions that people need to be in and um, to hold themselves in for a certain amount of time. So mobility and a little bit of core strength from my point of view from a pelvic cancer was important but I know for breast cancer you have to be able to lift your arms above your head and um, do you as a, a service or are there services across the UK that are offering that opportunity for people to prepare to get into that position physically? It really varies across the country so it is a question you know like giving patients autonomy to ask those questions you know is there a prehabilitation service is really important um it's definitely not nationwide uh, prehabilitation services and it depends on that pathway per patient so my biggest thing is to make sure you ask the team is there prehabilitation available for me and you can ask that from the off and to be honest it's something that we're trying to integrate into services from diagnosis so as soon as a gp maybe refers a patient you know you don't know whether it's cancer at that stage but is there a possibility for gps to start preparing patients and that could be around exercise and increasing you know cardiovascular fitness increasing respiratory fitness and um, you know i think everywhere at the moment is promoting exercise for health but specifically yeah. the cancer patients so i think if you can start to just walk or be physically active that's going to help you but i would also say just from a personal perspective mental health 
you know, going through a cancer diagnosis is really hard. Even if you've not actually been told you've got cancer yet, as soon as you think it could be cancer, that sends your mind into overdrive. You're not going to be sleeping properly. You know, subconsciously, you're always thinking about it. So getting out into nature, doing some physical activity and concentrating on your breathing, especially yeah. for me, I'll be like, right, can I breathe? I'm not thinking about I could potentially have cancer. So actually, I think exercise is perfect for that perspective as well. Okay. Um, and then thinking about prehabilitation in terms of psychological well-being, nutrition and exercise, I think is important. Having those three pillars. Um, yeah. A lot of people focus on the exercise, but actually there's lots of things that you can do increase hydration you know that's going to help and um, thinking about your kind of psychological well-being are you accessing support have you had anxiety depression in the past is this going to aggravate it are there things that potentially you can do and then again thinking about nutrition and what are you eating you know is your diet something that might need to be altered because altering it through treatment isn't always the best thing to do you need to start making changes straight away. And Naman, I don't know if you wanted to maybe add to that. Yeah, definitely. I think the more you can do to prepare, I mean, not as you said, not every department will be able to offer all the services, but I think even before you get to the exercise and stuff, maybe just looking up the radiotherapy centre, like where you park, I think that kind of comes into the mental health side of things as well, just knowing yeah, that's a good idea. where things are, um, where the toilets are, for example. Um, yeah. just Just that sort of thing as well. I think anything you can do even if it is just having someone that you know on the first day of treatment they're going to be there ready to give you a lift home that's that's still something trying to plan ahead as well i think one thing lots of people are doing at the moment is making sure they've got like meals kind of ready in the freezer so that if they live alone or they have someone else who's working it's a bit easier i know it sounds very simple practical things but actually lots of mm -hmm. patients that i see they say actually that was the best thing i did was make sure someone had a meal ready for me every day yeah because um, you know if unfortunately radiotherapy departments we can be delayed or like some of my patients travel over two hours for treatment you know you don't want to be coming home at 10 o'clock at night um and then you've got to make some dinner for yourself yeah i think that's really good advice particularly the parking because some hospitals have you know quite high charges or busy periods and it's helpful to know and i think sometimes they can offer free parking in certain areas so if you can yeah. get the right documentation you can park wherever you want I think um, a lot of a lot of hospitals now have to offer cancer patients free parking within their actual department. So absolutely, it's not always well advertised. So mm. that's one of the things on your kind of list to take. And I would also promote uh, patients writing any questions you've got, writing it down and taking it with you and just add to them. Um, yeah. you know, that's what we're here for is to answer questions. So don't feel I know some patients are really worried going, oh, I know your time's really precious. But actually, it's far easier to answer questions than helping to support someone who's not coping because they haven't had the opportunity to um, ask any questions that might be on their mind. Yeah, yeah. I used to turn up to my oncologist with a notepad and she kept telling me that every time I came, I came with a bigger notepad. <laughs> <laughs> so many questions. Um, well, we're um, the experts what about... though, aren't we? So like, it, exactly. we're, we're the ones exactly. who have the answers. So yeah, like, exactly. What and we're said. the ones that become more forgetful as time passes through the treatment. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Obviously you um, can record us as well. Um, not everyone's, like oh, yeah. legally you're allowed to, as long as you let us know. Um, I've had people record just because of chemo brain, for example, yeah. and go back to it. It's just a lot easier. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in terms of pre preparation, we've had a few questions around how to prepare the skin. Is there anything that you can do that will help the skin as you're going through your treatment? Yeah, so there's lots. Um, I think from probably even before you have your planning scan with us, you can start to do things. So the skin's there for like some protection barrier, but it needs to be hydrated, maintain its integrity so that when you come to radiotherapy, obviously not every treatment site will have a skin reaction. Some will have worse than others, um, especially if it's like in the folds or around the chest area some of the gynecological and uh, lower GI, gastrointestinal tract, um, they can have sort of worse side effects. But if you've been using a moisturiser for 10, 20 years, there's no point changing it. That's the guidance from the Society of Radiographers. So keep using the same one twice a day, um, trying to keep that kind of area well hydrated through creams, um, 
you know, if it is sunny at that time, try not to get sunburn mm -hmm. um, prior to treatment because it means your skin reaction will be a lot worse because your skin's already damaged and it's not ha well had enough enough. Sorry, it won't have enough time to heal before the treatment. Um, it's quite simple things like that, really. And if yeah. um, people are going to have chemotherapy um, or some of that lifestyle kind of stuff, say if you smoke, these are the sort of risk factors that can make your skin reaction a lot worse just because, I mean, smoking, as we know, lots of negative factors to your body, but um, it creates antioxidants that can really speed up a skin reaction. So I've seen a patient after the first day have a very bad skin reaction. And obviously that just limits your quality of life throughout the whole treatment. Um, mm. So quite simple advice. And actually the most simplest like, kind of bit is to drink in loads of water. Our cells are made of water. So not your teas, coffees and stuff like that, like just pure, I mean, not everyone likes the taste of water, but even squash is okay. It really yeah. helps just promote the integrity of the cells. Okay. So um, Joe, you mentioned planning. Um, talk us through what the patient has to do in the run up to their first treatment. So there's a lot of science, I say, that goes behind <laughs> the planning process. Um, so can you talk us through how someone might, you know, in the run up to their first treatment, what might happen to them? Yeah, so essentially when um, someone gets referred for radiotherapy treatment, they will typically see their oncologist or um, a consultant therapeutic radiographer or an advanced practitioner who will take them through the consent process. Now that consent process is actually really, really important and something that Numan and I really do try and get patients to consider because during that appointment, you can become overwhelmed because you get such a lot of information. But actually that information that you're presented with is what's going to allow you to look out for short and long term side effects. So we see a lot of patients 10, 20 years later with side effects and they're like, nobody ever told me about these side effects. Well, by law, we have to tell you about these side effects. But I can guarantee that it was in a five, 10 minute appointment. It might not have been explained fully. It might have been assumed that maybe you knew some of the terminologies that the oncologist was using. Um, and there's lots of reasons why maybe that information doesn't stay with you. But that consent form should be a vital piece of information for you to keep and keep hold of for years and years to think about some of the, the side effects that you may potentially develop. So, um, you know, taking someone with you to that appointment, recording it, keeping the documentation is is kind of the first piece of advice we would say. Then after that appointment, you will be referred for what we call a planning CT scan. So we use computed tomography. That's what CT stands for. And that's essentially where we're able to look inside the body at all of the different structures. So we're not uh, what a lot of patients think is that we're looking to see has the cancer got bigger has it come back again it's not a diagnostic imaging tool so if you were to use the ct scanner to help um kind of look at your cancer it's not really the same style that we that we necessarily use um so what we would do is do a ct scan but replicating exactly the position that you would have your radiotherapy in daily so another piece of advice is get comfortable. So mm. it can be really hard on that first day to think, oh, they're asking me to get into this position and I'm going to be really rigid and I'm really nervous and I'm not breathing properly. Um, but actually making sure that you're comfortable in that appointment is really, really important because that's the position you're going to be in. And some yeah. of our patients have up to eight weeks worth of treatment. That's mm. a long time to be in a position where you think, oh, I feel really awkward. I'm not comfortable. The pain is shooting through my spine. Try and get nice and nice and comfortable. You know, if you need extra time, if you want music on, if you want the lighting changed, you know, I know some radiotherapy departments that have aromatherapy oils that you can have. You know, this is your time to personalize your treatment. Um, so, you know, talk to the radiographers. If you're nervous, claustrophobic, there are lots of complementary therapies that are typically available to our patients. So again, you know, if you know that having a diagnostic CT scan is something that you worry about, ring mm -hmm. the department, talk to them ahead of time to say, I'm really nervous about this. Is there anything that can help me? And I know for any patients who have cancer in their head and neck area, they might have to wear an immobilization device. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and some people find that really scary, really claustrophobic. 
And so going for complementary therapies ahead of time or having some hypnotherapy, you know, um, acupuncture, that can actually help um, ensure that patients aren't stressed and anxious during that appointment. Um, and then during the actual CT scan itself, it should be relatively nice and quick. Again, it's personalized to every person. So it will vary depending on where we're treating into the in the body as to how long it will take, the position you're in, um, you know, what immobilization devices we use. We operate within two millimeters of accuracy. So because of that, we need to make sure that everything is exactly just so. Um, and then we go out of the room, but we're watching you all of the time. Um, and then it should, it takes probably about a minute, two minutes. It's, it's pretty speedy. Um, and essentially then when we come back in the room, we might do permanent tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, and that's again, something to kind of be aware of. Not all patients will need tattoos. There are other ways that we can actually um, identify the position that you're in for the CT. But the tattoos are there to make sure that we can align you in exactly the same position that you're in for that CT planning scan. And yeah. then the amazing dosimetrists, physicists, planning radiographers spring into action and they will use all of the software, um, amazing formulas, calculations. The oncologist will look at it. Um, you know, you might have advanced practitioners who are doing work on that radiotherapy treatment plan. And that will essentially allow them to create what will be your radiotherapy treatment treatment plan. Um, and that's essentially then what the treatment radiographers will use to set you up on a daily basis. Now, that can take the time. So a lot of patients will be like, I don't understand why I've got such a long way between that CT, planning CT and then the start of treatment is because we're not just sitting kind of idly thinking oh well you know let's go for a cup of tea there's so much going on in yeah. the background to try and do those plans and they have to be signed off so exactly the same as all processes within the nhs you can't rely on just one person doing it it has to be checked and double checked yeah and i i had the tattoos they don't really hurt i don't yeah. know what a real tattoo yeah. feels like but it's just like a pinprick yeah um Okay, so uh, you, you go through and the planning happens and then you get your treatments booked in. Um, mine were every weekday for, I think, five and a half weeks. Um, so is it always every weekday? Do you do weekend treatments or is the five days per week tends to be a normal schedule for a radiotherapy programme? Naman, did you want to answer? Yeah, <clears throat> so we usually do five days a week. Um, not just because we want the weekends off, but we need everyone's bodies and cells to heal between. So, I mean, lots of people ask, why can't I just have a massive dose in one day? Um, probably because it might kill you or cause irreversible damage. So we have a set, what we call fractionation. So you have a total dose, which is broken down into bite-sized chunks, same amount every day. Um, and that's kind of what to expect. And that's why we have you come five days a week. Um, sometimes we can do kind of a weekend treatment if we need to, if there's for example, some of the linear accelerators every week, they'll have like a weekly MOT, um, sort of clean or, you know, some engineering work. So we might have to bring people back on the Saturday. Um, but that's kind of what to expect, really. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest, and, I forgot your full question because I zoned out. <laughs> <did you say? laughs> um, so my, um, my next question was around, so for my gynae cancer, I had to drink a load of water beforehand and I wasn't allowed to go to the toilet. So I had a very full bladder which was actually one of the most dramatic parts of the treatment itself. I know for breast cancer or for some cancers of the chest as well, you have to hold your breath. Why do we have to do these things? It's not just a torture, I promise. Um, <laughs> so depending on internal anatomy, um, especially in the pelvic region, we can't always keep it in the same place all the time. So if you think everyone's anatomy is slightly different, um, positioning of where, you know, if there's surgery, for example, that sort of thing. Um, so the bladder you know, it helps keep the treatment area um, or the target volume, we sometimes call it, where we want it to be. And it also removes some of that anatomy of the bladder out of the, the treatment. So if it's too small, it would effectively fall into the, where the highest dose of radiation would come in. Um, mm -hmm. That's the pelvic stuff. I won't go too geeky because this is Joe's radiobiology science. So I'll let her say it. But for holding your breath, it's normally for people who are having kind of the left side of their chest. So where, usually where the heart falls, um, unless you have that condition where your heart's on the opposite side. But 
most likely will be on the left side. So it's to lift the chest wall away as you breathe in and effectively take the radiation dose away from the, by the edge of the heart. Um, so heart sparing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that, you know, if you can't hold your breath, that's completely fine. Obviously we'll coach you into it. There are some really good resources called the, uh, this from the Respire Project, which is to help people having chest wall um, or breast treatment kind of get ready and prepared. It's almost like a prehab tool. Um, but if, you know, if someone can't hold their breath for whatever reason, that's fine because the physicist dosimetrists work even harder and we can use lots of special ways with the machine um, just to shield the heart. So actually we can still avoid it, but obviously it'd be more optimal to be able to do some form of breath hold. But again, if you can't, that's completely fine because we'll just shield it out. But I'll let Jo talk about the radiobiology because she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> we usually have like a plan B, C, D and E because every patient's different. And I mm -hmm. think that's the big thing is that patients will typically, especially those who are on Instagram and, and using peer support groups, they'll talk to each other and they'll get a bit kind of daunted by the fact that someone has the same kind of cancer as them, but their treatment looks very different. I suppose it's just to reassure people that every treatment is individual and personalized. Yeah. And, you know, some patients can't get into a certain position. They can't hold their breath or, you know, their internal anatomy looks very, very different. And so that's why every patient might have a slightly different regime. You know, some patients might have to empty their bowels. Some patients might have to have an enema. Some patients might have to have a, an empty bladder versus a full bladder. And again, it's just really dependent on where we're treating, what the internal anatomy looks like. And that's typically where the therapeutic radiographers will be quite specific. And sometimes that can change as well through treatment. We do lots of imaging through treatment to make sure we're in the right place, to make sure that we're treating the structures um, that we need to be treating. And so sometimes we might tweak things as we go through as well. Um, so again, just to reassure anyone who's going through that process going, oh, that doesn't sound like what happened to me. It's just to reassure you really, because every patient is absolutely individual and personalized from that perspective. Yeah. In terms of radio biology. Yeah, sorry. Just before I forget, um, I think something that's been coming up for the past few years is people will come through, they've been told by their friend to have a really full bladder make sure it's comfortably full because if you come in with a thousand mils in your bladder coming onto treatment where you're really struggling that's really really <laughs> difficult to replicate and also i think people get more stressed about it because they're not reaching and it, maybe it becomes a bit of a competition to make sure you reach the same amount of volume but as joe said it's about what's comfortable for you so mm -hmm. if you know your comfortably full bladder you know doesn't have to be the, the point where your stomach's bulging out i just yeah so sorry just something to add joe sorry to interrupt you no, it's good. Um, and then I suppose from the radiobiology perspective and thinking about how we use radiotherapy, our normal cells are replicating and, and we will irradiate normal cells. It's unavoidable, unfortunately. And so we need a certain period of time to allow those normal cells to repair themselves. Um, and that's six hours. So when we look at radiobiology, six hours is needed for those cells to repair. And so anyone having maybe more than one dose of radiotherapy in a day um, may have a six hour gap in between. So there mm -hmm. are some um, lung regimes. So anyone with a certain type of lung cancer um, who fits an eligibility criteria will essentially have three doses of radiotherapy a day, but they have to have six hours apart. Um, so again, it's when we're kind of creating our dose and fractionation regimes it's based on radiobiology so we're trying to really target those cancer cells and damage the dna of those cancer cells so they can't repair themselves um, but at the same time we're trying to ensure that any normal healthy cells are limited and that if they are irradiated that we give them time to repair as well mm -hmm. very interesting so much to know. Um, <laughs> so I arrived for my first radiotherapy treatment and um, there's kind of nice waiting room area, isn't there? Does, do jigsaws still happen post-COVID? Because that was <laughs> one of my favourite things. I used to turn up because I had to like do the whole bladder filling, do some jigsaw and then go in for my treatment and then come out and the next day I'd do a little bit more of jigsaw. Do they still exist in the radiotherapy waiting rooms? No. Oh, sad. Really? I don't think so. Although that sounds like a really nice idyllic way to pass the time by. I've I've never been in a department with a jigsaw. <laughs> oh, I loved it. Do you I still do them, Sarah? 
Yes, I turned up early. I'd go in and do my little jigs. So I have the chats to the other people who were in at the same time as me. You know, five weeks, you get to know the people in, in the waiting room, do my bit of jigs or go in for my treatment and then come back out and um, check how much progress had been made. Not much. <laughs> So you could tell when it was a good jigsaw because it would go it would be gone the next week. So yeah, um, um that's sad that doesn't happen. But there there is, yeah, fair entertainment in the waiting room because it can be you know, there are delays. Also if my bladder wasn't the right fullness and then I need to go to the toilet again, we had to start all over again. So um yes, anyway, normally running to time, obviously and uh what does what does the room look like so i've never if you've never been in a room before you walk in Go the on. bed well <laughs> yeah it can it can be quite daunting as i said um the linear accelerator that we use has to be big because it does a lot um and essentially it's producing this really high ionizing radiation it's only on when we're out of the room all the interlocks are on everything's been checked um, so the room isn't radioactive. We get lots of patients going, oh, you know, I really want to spend time with my grandchildren, but I know I can't whilst I'm having radiotherapy. And we're like, no, for, for external beam radiotherapy, you're absolutely fine. Um, you know, there's no radioactive sources within within that room. Um, and so essentially what we're what we're trying to do is get you into the position that you're on for CT um, planning. And that does incorporate a very hard couch so i'm sure you can testify sarah that it isn't a nice like emma mattress or a very <laughs> nice like temper um it is essentially carbon fiber so if you knock it it sounds like you're knocking on wood knocking on a door um but it's there so that you don't sink because as you can imagine because we're treating within two millimeters of accuracy if we had a nice soft mattress we'd squidge into it and so that means your position would be very different on a daily basis. And we also have to treat through the couch. So the machine can rotate a full 360 degrees around you. And the couch can also rotate 360 degrees to get to the angles that we need to position the radiation. And because of that, we need to be able to treat through it. And obviously, a nice squidgy mattress is going to affect our dose somewhat. So yeah. the carbon fiber couch is actually really important for us um, within radiation therapy. You will sometimes find for patients who um, might be having treatment to ease any symptoms of their cancer. So we're not aiming to cure, but we're aiming to hopefully help with things like pain relief or bleeding. Then actually we might be nice and we'll give them a nice squidgy mattress um, because the dose isn't as important um, for where we're actually delivering the treatment um, and then obviously we might have various immobilization devices that will replicate exactly uh, the ct so by the time you come for treatment you should kind of know what it feels like because mm -hmm. you've had that ct planning scan okay um clothing one thing i finally got right by the end so no metal i think i came in like really comfy leggings and a t-shirt that I because I had to take off my bottom half which was never a nice thing to do in a room yeah. um but something that was easy re easily removed so that I didn't have to put the gown on every single time and so I think if you have the other half then you have to take the top off but having something that you could just take off quite quickly and not have to take all of your clothes off is quite useful so I would say that was one of my tips is to wear nothing with metal in it so the metal obviously is not like an MRI scanner. You're not gonna be wearing belt suddenly fly halfway across the room. Um, it's more that when we take an image, we don't want it to be in the way because it just causes the image to look a bit fuzzy. Um, but yeah, e easy clothes. Obviously, we're never gonna have you fully naked. We'll always have you covered up for dignity. And if you're not yeah. comfortable with like, obviously there'll be male radiographers. That's completely fine. I won't take it personally. Um, it's you know it's your comfort, it's your treatment. So that's fine. Yeah. And the other thing to say that if you have a cough or sneeze don't try not to move um, as undignified as it is just sneeze into the air obviously the droplets are going to fall on you but we can help clean up and make you look pretty and before you leave but if you move even a millimeter we will just start again because for safety reasons i mean yeah we're very fussy anyway um so that's fine honestly and actually i've spoke, spoke to one of the engineers recently and one linear accelerator can have in upwards of 72 different safety features so if one thing goes wrong the radiation stops or mm -hmm. if we look outside, like it's, it's very, very safe. 
I mean, you, you don't get radiotherapy errors from that side of things because there's so many different interlocks. Um, yeah. So yeah. And one thing I would say as well is it can it can be really daunting from a patient perspective. I've had a lot of people stare at my vagina and my cervix um, over the years, and it is, yeah, <laughs> but it's it can be really really embarrassing you kind of think oh you know I really don't want people to have to stare at me but from the opposite side I have to say like it doesn't even go through our heads so I know you know speaking to nurses who do smear tests every single day it's just we don't that we don't even think about it um and I know it's easy for us to say that but I suppose I'm trying to help reassure people you know from a patient perspective and from a healthcare professional perspective please don't worry like I especially for any gynecological anal cancer um patients at all there's a there's a temptation to go oh, do, do I smell do I need to like spray some please don't spray any perfumes yeah. or any like please do not worry at the end of the day you've got cancer you're going yeah. through a cancer treatment it's all about just just breathe and make sure you're nice and happy and feel as comfortable as you co possibly can be if you're lying there and we've left you exposed s say i'm not uh, happy yeah. and exposed please can you yeah. cover me up yeah yeah i think from my point of view that was definitely like the hardest thing was taking you know my bottom half off every single time i went in i mean after five weeks to get used to it but um it is quite uh, difficult yeah and even little things like where do I put my clothes where are my knickers yeah. like do I walk across the room half naked like it can be really tricky but I think just knowing that you need to do whatever you need to do to be comfortable so if yeah. you want to walk over and you say actually can I have a paper tissue to walk yeah. across the room with absolutely ask for it you know be really strict with the radiographers about what you want because we would be mortified if we knew that patients were really struggling with dig dignity and respect. No one's yeah. ever going to go, oh, can you just can you just drop that tissue? Because I want to see you walk across the room naked. No one yeah. is ever going to say that. So, yeah, yeah, just whatever makes you most comfortable, I think. OK. Well, um, and so we've mentioned a few of the side effects of um, radiotherapy. I think the main one being the skin, um, redness and soreness, but also um, an cumulative fatigue levels and I know from my professional background now that actually the cancer related fatigue exercise is one of the best treatments so keeping up that daily walking keeping up your movement is really important and you've mentioned a bit of hydration to make sure that the skin is fully hydrated but also that you don't get too hydrated because it's quite dehydrating isn't it um uh, radiotherapy generally you have to drink a lot during your treatment and um, is there anything else that you can do to help reduce some of those side effects um i will say just quickly for the skin there's not always redness so if you've got really dark skin it will show up as really dark um yeah. that could be for anywhere on the body and actually once people with really light skin if the skin has gone redder and then it becomes darker once the treatment's finished it might look like a tan and that's completely normal but usually within six weeks skin tone goes back to normal um so yeah the I think the fatigue side of things, exactly as Joe said, of how the cells work, the best way kind of I explain it, and I've checked with Joe that I'm saying the right thing, that she's a lecturer, but um, as we attack the cells, <clears throat> the six hours after, as, as Joe said, that's the therapeutic window. Any cancer cells that are killed off by the radiation, they'll be removed from the body through all sorts of different ways, but that takes a lot of energy, those processes. At the same time, any normal mm -hmm. cells that are damaged, they obviously their DNA can replicate and get their cells working back to normal. But obviously each of those cells are being a slightly different area within the cell cycle but both of those mechanisms hand in hand that's why people feel the most tired normally the six hours after treatment and that accumulation exactly as you said sarah is actually probably 10 to 14 days if not in the third week post radiotherapy when people feel it the most when their body is yeah. just okay no more radiation is coming in now actually we're fully healing it can take up to six weeks um yeah. for the tiredness and i'm, I'm not going to say back to normal because everyone will have a new normal post radiotherapy and actually some people will maybe have a baseline of fatigue for a while and it can be months afterwards, especially if you've had chemotherapy or for any kind of gynae where you've had extra internal BRCA therapy afterwards. I think it's just be mindful that when we say, you know, treatment's over, it can continue for a bit and it's normal, but that's when kind of late effects and stuff. Um, yeah, that, that's when I that, think that is, that, that is key. It's, um, you know, I, 
I speak a lot to people about how oh you finish your treatment and actually you're right the side effects do continue and I think you have to be kind to yourself because um they can keep going particularly the radiotherapy for quite some time afterwards um and that's another reason when you've had like breast cancer for example to make sure that you keep up your exercises because if that therapy is is carrying on you're still going to get that tightness within the chest so it's important to carry on the physio-based exercises hopefully that you've been given radiation fibrosis can occur at any time after radiotherapy so you know you could you could be 20 years post-treatment and your cells are still affected by the radiation. Um, so as a consequence of that, you could have late effects. Um, and it is just really important to kind of consider that. So thinking about where did you have treatment? What muscles, bone were in the area? What, what, you know, what structures are there that potentially have received some dose? Mm-hmm. And I think that can help you think about some of the short and the long term side effects. But absolutely, you know, making sure you're aware of, maybe some of those side effects that you can keep an eye out for and if you can then do things to prevent that as much as possible then do it and you know there's lots of exercise um, regimes that potentially you can do and you know you can get rehabilitation services as well and for some patients it's just being aware and again seeking that advice and support but Numan and I say there is no back to normal Um, Mm. it's really important for patients to consider that and I think sometimes even myself I kind of think oh well you know it's a relatively easy treatment for for my cancer I'll be absolutely fine but I'm 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 not my I'm physically I'm not the same as I was before so I think it and I don't think anyone is even just psychologically you've had cancer that's always going to be in the back of your mind Um, and so I think it's about being kind to yourself but also being aware and kind of facing that head on to go how am I now going to cope with my new normal and Mm -hmm. if you can't cope with that new normal what do you need to do what help and advice do you need from healthcare professionals or people like yourself Sarah working in communities and thinking about how can I access that support to find how I'm living with my new normal. Mm. And there's some great organisations out there like Life After Cancer who take people through programmes, like more, more kind of emotional support, mm. and they're in a group setting so that you can talk to other people who've been through the same thing that you have. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, skin protection post radiotherapy, but also like during. So don't not changing your moisturiser if you've used something previously. Um, are there any particularly good moisturisers that you would recommend to use during treatment? So the guidance from Society of Radiographers, um, and that's probably after 20 years of research into it, there is no premium cream. Um, it's, yeah, there's not enough evidence for any cream that's better. I know lots of people are now starting to use aloe vera gels or based creams. The aloe vera gels are great, but they actually dry the skin out, which is not what we want. We want to promote that integrity, keep it hydrated, just to basically protect the skin. Um, so actually using an aloe vera gel is fine, but it's better to use it post-radiotherapy treatment. But during just a cream, so something basic is completely fine. I think mean, lots of people say E45, but actually mm-hmm. people with really dark skin is actually really bad for them because it really dries their oh, skin really. out. So again, it, it really varies. So people with really dark skin is very oily. They might need an oil-based one or something like shea butter. Um, for other people, E45 is completely fine. If you have a skin condition before, where you've used like double base or something like that, that's completely fine. Keep using the same thing. But as we'd always say, speak to the treatment review teams um, or the therapeutic radiographers, because that's what they should be advising. Obviously, we've the, there's a the brilliant patient leaflets for by the Society of Radiographers that says this, which has all the myths about skin care. And make sure you don't use any sun cream in the affected treatment area at all during treatment. So the metallic elements in that, they can really make the skin reaction worse. And actually, you shouldn't really be using sun cream in the area um, until probably at least two or three weeks post radiotherapy um, for that same reason. And obviously, depending on where you've been treated on the body, that skin will always be more susceptible to the sun um, just forever. So it's not just three, four months post radiotherapy, it will be forever. So for example, if you've had your head and neck treated, you will have to use factor 50 and above um, and make sure you're covered and just be really careful. And you might find that where you've been treated will tan a lot quicker than other areas. So it's just something to be mindful of if you're in the sun. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the questions is around, is factor 50 enough? So I think it's factor 50 and in the shade, pretty much. Yeah. There is The right research down. actually suggests that there's not much, I teach skin cancers, and there's not much research that suggests that anything over factor 30 is any better. Um, yeah, because sometimes I think, as, yeah, I think like sometimes that. there's a, a, a perception that if people are using higher factor sun creams, they don't have to apply it so regularly. When actually that's that's the opposite, and especially um a hundred percent you know like the full sunblock or what they yeah. advertise as full sunblock it's actually got so many chemicals in it i would I wouldn't necessarily advise that as a therapeutic radiographer because of just how many chemicals are in it wh oh, whether it's going to agitate the skin mm, interesting um, so yeah, but um, trying to avoid the sun as much is our biggest advice biggest, yeah. Um, and we just had a question just around actual damage. So broken veins, like the skin looking generally different. Does that ever go away or does that, will that stay like that? No, I know. I think it was Leslie, wasn't it? Sorry, yeah. Leslie. It's called, it's called telectantasia. So it's essentially where the capillaries are affected by the radiation and it just stops some of the blood flow through it um, going through them. And that creates that like spider vein appearance. Sometimes you can notice it in people that smoke quite heavily. They have poor circulation in their face and you can sometimes see spider veins. That's essentially what the radiotherapy is caused in that area. Um, so there are um, ways to get around it. So if it's something you're really conscious of and you can visibly see it, there are some really good makeup um things that you can use now like foundation that where you could maybe use makeup to try and hide them if it's something that affects you a lot yeah it's difficult isn't it there's this damage and things like that that you don't necessarily expect yeah. to experience and to go on for that long um so sorry I'm, I'm conscious of time and we have so many questions um but i wanted to ask just about brachytherapy so um, I found out during my cancer and exercise course that actually they're using brachytherapy in other cancers as well as the non-pelvic ones, so breast cancer as well. Um, so you probably are going to do a better job of explaining what brachytherapy is. Um, so I don't know who wants to take this one. Do you want to start? I feel like I've talked a lot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I suppose, yeah, so brachytherapy, there's lots of different types of radiotherapy. Brachytherapy is basically just internal, where we would do a very high dose of radiation safely, probably if we can, directly next to or within the tumour area. Um, so there are lots of different types. Um, some are more experimental and some aren't commissioned with the NHS. So as far as I know, Joe might correct me, but breast, so internal operative radiotherapy, I'm not sure it's commissioned here. Um, okay. I've seen some trials around it abroad, but I'm not sure it's being used here. I know for some head and neck uh, lymphomas or esophageal cancers, there are types, but pelvic is probably the most commonly known ones. Yeah. Um, but yeah, depending on where it is, um, you can have, uh, you know, for, for gynecological, um, basically very, very close using a different, like a different applicator set. Sometimes it'll be done under anaesthetic, sometimes just local anaesthetic. It's basically just trying to add a booster to that area after having had external beam radiotherapy. Um, I think, Joe, you'll be better at the science um, around it. Yeah, so we're using a radiation source. So it's not the same as external beam where we're creating high ionizing x-rays and then they're penetrating through the body to the area where we want to deposit all the dose. Essentially, what we're trying to do is put a radiation source directly next to the site of the cancer or where the cancer is, depending on whether someone's had surgery previously or not. So how we do that for a gynecological cancer where maybe vagina cervix we would essentially put in a rod and the rod would go and be packed out so again you can't have movement so that's i think one of the really and sarah you might be able to explain this how it feels from a patient perspective but being isolated in a room on your own and not being able to move is probably very psychologically scarring. Um, and it's something that patients often report um, around that whole element of brachytherapy. But essentially, we pack the vagina so that the, the um, applicator can't move at all, like at all. Um, and then we will transfer that patient through to the treatment room where we would then put the radiation sources through the wires and in through the rod. And then they just sit there and deposit 
the radiation the room is a special a special room it's a lead lined room um and essentially you know everywhere is very different but you might have a telephone you might have tv radio you know it depends on how long you're in there and it's just to be aware that again that varies person to person because the dose um of that radiation source um will be different for every single person and also because we're using a source actually how old that source is can also determine the half what we call the half life mm -hmm. so actually as we use that radiation source more and more the half life is obviously affected which means that we might have to have it in place for longer to deliver the same amount of radiation and that's sometimes why people could spend a lot longer than previous people who had exactly the same treatment six months previous oh, okay yeah and no, i was pretty much sedated for mine oh that's um, good <laughs> I had a spinal block and then i was sedated so um i was i, I was uh, conscious for the treatment itself but the preparation i was under so yeah. it yeah. was much more not i'm not going to say relaxing but um <laughs> yeah Less it's, not, it's not it's not synonymous is it that word that you no, use with any no. cancer treatment <laughs> okay um i just have had one question just around lymphedema um so i think this lady's had um lymph nodes removed and um she is having radiotherapy to around the neck area so from my own experience i know that if you've had lymph nodes removed and you have radiotherapy to the lymph nodes that does increase your risk of, of lymphedema um, but it depends generally how many lymph nodes you've had taken as to how high that risk is. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're correct. Um, normally they'll do, if they can, depending on the departments, like an assessment. Um, so they'll me basically measure the fluid level and they can do a before, usually they'll do a before and after treatment. So if, for example, some areas in the body where there are lots of lymph nodes in the neck, there are loads, um, sometimes a lymphedema isn't as severe and depending as you said how many are taken out and what levels they're on um so yeah that that's kind of what it is but it's probably managing it from the start so for example if you have lymph nodes in, uh, in your armpit as well it's about trying not to use too much weight on that side and saying mm -hmm. your neck's a bit more difficult because it's yeah it's your neck it supports your head which is the heaviest part of the body but it's you can do self-massage um yeah, exactly. there are some more services i know coming up um which are linked to hospitals or hospices that have that equipment and just by yeah. measuring it they can monitor it um sometimes if it's like arm lymphedema or leg lymphedema the sleeves are really good even if they're prophylactic mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah, I think self um, manual lymphatic drainage is, is a good one. Um, if you can get anybody to teach you how to do that, it's very straightforward and quite simple. And that just keeps everything moving and taking it to less affected areas means that it can drain more effectively. I think the big thing with lymphedema is as soon as you think that you're experiencing anything is to get help and support straight. Don't put it mm -hmm. off. Um, yeah. You know, even if you have a bit of a niggle thinking, oh, I don't, oh, I'm not quite sure. Just get it checked. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and then final question, just in terms of anyone that is um, just about to start their radiotherapy, um, hasn't necessarily listened to this or wants something to sit and read, where can they go to to find information or pictures of maybe the, the machine itself? Because, you know, it's just nice to know. Rad chat. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. We, we did Sorry. a What is Radiotherapy um, episode as well. I think it's number three number three okay. going through what it is um but yeah i know it's hard not to google but try not to google if you do google things like look at the society of radio Opera's website um or obviously we can link some things with you as well sarah but yeah um, normally if you look at radiotherapy in google it doesn't have the most positive images of things um so just be mindful what you're looking at yeah and we're more yeah. than happy sarah to for anyone who's answered asked questions that we've not had a chance to answer if they want to leave the comments um, after this has been posted on your grid, we'd be more than happy to go in and help answer them. Um, I suppose we don't necessarily offer um, personalised, tailored clinical support. We always yeah. advise people to go and talk to their teams, but to link to resources and things, we'd be more than happy to talk about. And obviously for long and short term side effects, you know we can tell you what typically happens we we can't diagnose anyone and um, through instagram but more than happy to help people the royal college of radiologists is actually really good as well 
Mm -hmm. um, but it is quite scientific and sometimes if if you've if you've not worked within healthcare before it can be quite challenging um but also things like macmillan cancer research uk i i say macmillan because i've vetted uh, some of their radiotherapy advice there's lots on there <laughs> um but yeah it, you know there's good supportive information but also don't be afraid to check out your radiotherapy department website sometimes they're really good some departments have an instagram account or a twitter account sometimes you can find out information there and if you can't find the information, please ring. Like, yeah. that's what our su amazing support workers are there for. That's what our amazing receptionists are there for, to help ease people's concerns. So please don't sit worrying. There's lots of people you can talk to. Um, and even when you go and see your oncologist, say you want more information, where can you find that out? Yeah, brilliant. There's a Maggie Centre as well. They're pretty good. Oh, yeah, Maggie's, um, yeah. So with our Maggie Centre in West of London, we do... Uh, once a week like radiotherapy getting prepared for it so people can come in prior to their treatment and just have a chat with one of us there's always a therapy oh, radio over there um, yeah so quite a few departments will do videos or uh, i was gonna say parent evening not parent evening um like a patient <laughs> evening <laughs> just so you can come in um sometimes you, you some if they're doing them now post covid i know where i used to work before we would have a physicist there just symmetrist there they'd go through a plan tell you what's going on you could go and see the linear accelerator in the evening um obviously no patients in there but at least you know what the room looks like to familiarize yeah. yourself find out where the toilets are you know that sort of yeah. thing yeah i'd Brilliant. also say as well sometimes people will have a clinical nurse specialist they don't always necessarily know about radiotherapy so again you know if you ask them questions and they're not quite sure don't worry just phone the radiotherapy department okay brilliant amazing advice thank you so much both for joining us i think i mean i've had a few comments of people that i know it's just so useful to speak about this and i wish there was some kind of information like this before i'd gone in so i hope it's helpful to people who haven't started yet or people that are going through their treatment at the moment um but thank you and do listen to rad chat they've got some great information and really interesting people me included <laughs> 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 so uh uh yes um follow them and um ask many questions and thank you so much for listening everyone and i look forward to seeing you all soon oh, and thank you both thank you